Three little piggies went out to the woods. One built a house made of straw. The second used sticks and the third used bricks. And came the big bad wolf at the door. Throughout the tale, you will learn much more. A long, long time ago, there were three little pigs. And the three little pigs all lived in a tiny house with their mother, who loved them very, very much. However, one day their mother sat them down to breakfast and made an important announcement. <coughs> you are all now too big to live in my small house, she said. So, it's time for you all to go out into the forest and to take care of yourselves. It is very important that you build your houses as soon as possible, because then you will all be safe from the big bad wolf. And as the three loved ones set off into the forest, their mother shed a tear and said to herself, I just hope the big bad wolf don't catch them before they build their houses. And the three little pigs gingerly walked down into the forest along a winding footpath. And it was by a weeping willow tree that they met a strange spindly old hag with a shock of straw hair that reached the sky. Uh, please, old hag, uh, I, I mean old, old woman, <laughs> um, please, please may I cut some of your straw hair off? asked the first little pig. You see, you see, I need to build a home as soon as possible so that I don't get eaten by the big bad wolf and I could use the leftover straw to build my dream home, you see. Well, uh, as it happens, yeah, I could do with a trim, yeah, replied the old hag. So the first little pig flattered the old hag into having a short back and sides, thus ensuring that he had enough straw to build his house. Oh, I am so pleased with my house, said the first little pig. The big bad wolf won't catch me now. It looks very nice, said the second little pig, but the house I build will be stronger than yours. And mine will be even stronger, boasted the third little pig. Anyway, the second and the third little pigs went about their travels, and whilst crossing a rickety old footbridge, they met a giant insect made of sticks. Uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. Hello, uh, excuse me, uh, giant stick insect, said the second little pig. Uh, you have given me an idea. Y you see, you see, I need to build myself a house, um, and perhaps I could make it out of sticks. Well, now, that's an interesting thing you should say there. You are in luck, as it happens, said the giant stick insect, because I am about to molt. And as he did so, he left enough sticks for the second little pig to build the house of his dreams. The big bad wolf won't catch me now, said the second little pig with a chuffed and slightly smug smile on his face. Good, said the slightly leaner giant stick insect as he trundled off over the rickety bridge. Oh, it's very nice, said the third little pig, but I can assure you my house will be so much stronger than yours and he wandered off into the forest alone. In almost no time at all, the third little pig had bumped into a young man building a wall. Hi, said the third little pig, and uh, what's your name? Well, my name is Adrian, replied the young man, and I am building Adrian's wall. Yeah, get that. Oh, how, 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 how great, said the third little pig. Now listen, uh, uh, it's a bit cheeky, but if I help you to build that wall, may I have some of the leftover bricks to build my house so that I can be safe from the big bad wolf, requested the third little pig. Oh, well, of course, said Adrian. And the third little pig helped to build the famous Adrian's wall and was granted enough bricks to build his dream home. Ah, the big bad wolf can never catch me now, he said, as he looked at his big, sturdy house with a feeling of pride and joy. Anyway, a week later, the big bad wolf spotted the house of straw. The smell of the first little pig made him hungry, and he knocked on the door 
and he says, Hey, let me in, little pig. Let me come in now. I, 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 I want to welcome you, obviously, to the neighborhood. <laughs> Through the little letterbox, the first little pig cried, No! No! By the hair of my chinny chin chin, I will not let you in! Then I will huff, and I will puff, and I will blow your house in, growled the increasingly menacing big bad wolf. And that's exactly what he did. He picked up the first little pig and he gobbled him up in a matter of seconds. Oh, mm. oh excuse me. Oh, yummy, yummy, yummy. Oh. Mm. But I'm, uh, I'm still very hungry indeed, said the big bad wolf. And so the wolf continued on his travels through the forest. And as he did, he spotted the house that the second little pig had built with sticks. Mmm, I can smell another little piggy, thought the wolf. And he banged on the door. Uh, oh, 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 please, please, open the door, little piggy. I want to come in. I'm a nice, very nice big bad wolf, and, and it's so cold out here, said the big bad wolf. No! No way, the second little pig said from the bedroom window. By the hair of my chinny chin chin, I will not let you in. Oh, really? Well, then I shall huff, and I shall puff, and I shall blow your house in, growled the big bad wolf, showing all of his big, sharp teeth. And he blew, and he blew, until all the sticks fell down. And then the big bad wolf grabbed the second little pig and gobbled him up in no time at all. And now it was not very long before the big bad wolf, the very same one, chanced upon the house of bricks built by the third little pig. And as he banged on that door, the big bad wolf said, Come on, a little piggy wiggy wiggy, let me in um, because um, I, uh, I, uh, ah, yes, I, I, I bring a newsletter from the neighborhood watch. Absolutely not, said the third little pig as he peered from a window in the attic. No, no, by the hair of my chinny chin chin, I will not let you in. Then I will huff and I will puff and I will blow your house in, snarled the big bad wolf. And he huffed and he puffed. But when he blew, nothing happened at all. Drat! said the big bad wolf. That brick house is too strong for me. <laughs> I must do something very brainy and clever. And that's what I'll do. I shall befriend this clever little piggy. Uh, <coughs> little piggy, he said, changing his tone, uh, to welcome you to the community, I would like to take you to my allotment on the other side of the rickety bridge, uh, and there I will help you fill your basket with as many vegetables as you like, so you can make a huge stew which will be simply delicious. So, be there at nine o'clock sharp, okay? Well, it sounds like a good plan to me said the third little pig. I will see you there tomorrow morning. Okie dokie then. I look forward to it then, my new friend, <laughs> said the big bad wolf, thinking he'd planned the perfect crime. But the third little pig wasn't stupid. He knew the big bad wolf wanted to gobble him up. So the next morning, he arrived at the allotment at eight o'clock and filled up his basket with as many vegetables as possible. And when the big bad wolf arrived at nine o'clock, he was furious to see all of his vegetables gone. Ah, that a clever little piggy wiggy has tricked me. Ah, but I must go to his house and still pretend to be his friend. Ah. So he knocked on the door of the third little pig's house. A little piggy, my friend, uh, answer the door, he said smarmily. And when the third little pig looked through the attic window, he said, Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm too busy peeling the vegetables, but thank you so much for my housewarming gift. Your allotment is wonderful. <laughs> no problem, said the fuming wolf. So be ready tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. I have a treat for you. I will take you to an orchard by the babbling stream on the other side of the hill. And there I will help you pick some of the best Granny Smith's apples you have ever tasted. Sure enough, 
The next morning, the third little pig arrived at the orchard at seven o'clock and climbed up a tree and helped himself to some scrumptious Granny Smith apples. But suddenly, the big bad wolf appeared, causing the little pig to be very frightened indeed. Oh, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Wolf, said the little pig, pretending not to be scared. Uh, would you uh, like some apples? And before the wolf could respond, the little pig pelted the big bad wolf with loads and loads and loads of apples. Knocking him out cold. And as the terrified little pig started to run home with apples in his hand, he passed a fun fair. which made him feel so excited that he just could not resist trying his luck on the coconut shy, where he won a lovely bunch of coconuts. But unfortunately, the wolf had gained consciousness and was catching up with his latest prey. I'm going to get you, little piggy, he snarled. But the quick-thinking little pig hurled two enormous coconuts at the wolf, causing him to lose his balance and land in a huge barrel of sticky cream cheese. And as he came around, the wolf seethed, he will pay for this, I hate cheese, it stinks, and my head is sore. But by now, the little pig was safely back inside his house. So the wolf banged on the little pig's door and shouted, How dare you steal all my vegetables and throw apples and coconuts at me and cause me to become cheesy? I am going to climb down your chimney and I am going to gobble you up, third little piggy. But the third little piggy didn't panic. No, he had an idea. He started to boil a huge cauldron of water in the fireplace and into it he put all of the vegetables from the wolf's allotment. The Granny Smith's apples from the orchard and the milk from the coconuts he won at the fair. The big bad wolf climbed to the roof of the house. <laughs> now I'm going to get you, laughed the wolf. Unfortunately, the big bad wolf slipped and slithered down the chimney faster and faster until plop, with a big splash, he tumbled head first into the boiling water, along with the vegetables, the Granny Smith's apples and the coconut milk. Adding salt and pepper to the simmering cauldron, the clever little pig smiled to himself. Now, I really do have a delicious stew with wonderful organic ingredients and the cream cheese from the barrel is an added bonus. And what's more, I will never have to be afraid of the big bad wolf again. Well, over the next few years, the recipe for the third little pig stew became so famous that birds were tweeting it from the treetops. Consequently, the woodland creatures came from far and wide to meet the third little piggy, who was now basking in the glory of his newfound fame. After all, he had become a celebrity chef. Piggy. there lived a young girl by the name of Beauty. Beauty lived with her father Horace and her two sisters, Flo and Mo. One fine sunny afternoon, Horace was taking a trip to the local shops. Uh, girls, whilst I'm at the shops, I'm going to buy each one of you a present, he said. Oh, oh, shopping is it? Right, well, what I want is a great, absolutely brilliant frilly dress, right, to make me look fantastic. And make sure it has got all the trimmings, okay? 
Good, and don't mess it up, you old fool, said Flo. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and I want a hat, and you better make it a nice one. Okay, said Mo. Uh, of course, girls, I I'll see what I can do, said Horace. Then he asked Beauty what she would like. I would like a red rose, please, father, answered Beauty, modestly. So Horace went to the shops and he managed to find a dress for Flo and a hat for Mo. But he could not find the red rose that Beauty had requested. And as he headed back from the shops through a remote Everglade, the wind began to howl and there was a huge blizzard of snow, causing Horace to be lost and confused. And then, for no apparent reason, a beautiful palace appeared at the top of a hill. Feeling cold, and noticing the door was ajar, Horace entered the palace. He searched around, but found nobody at home. However, he did find a nice roaring fire and lots of food to eat. From a larder in the kitchen, he helped himself to some gammon, some salmon, bananas, sultanas and several thick slices of ham. After his feast, he settled down in an armchair next to the fire and feeling very content and very safe from the howling winds outside, Horace yawned and fell into a deep sleep. The next morning, Horace woke up. He looked out of the window and he could see that the blizzard of snow had disappeared. The sun was shining in the deep blue sky. And as he left for home, he noticed an exquisite rose bush in the palace grounds. Ah, said Horace, that reminds me. I must pick one of these roses for Beauty's present. Then I will have kept my promise to all of my three daughters. Ha <laughs> ha! As soon as he had plucked the rose from the bush, Horace heard a dreadful growling sound from behind an oak tree and an extremely ugly growling beast appeared. Hey, you, old man, how dare you take one of my roses without my permission? Eh, eh, you are in deep trouble. Ooh, oh dear, uh, uh, ooh, said Horace. Now, uh, you must understand that uh, the rose is for my daughter. Uh, you see, I promised her one as a present. Oh, yeah? Well, that is my rose, you little thief said the beast, adding, But, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. Yes, you can keep the rose, but then you have to bring me back your daughter, OK? It's a fair swap. And besides, by the way, if you don't do as I say, I will track you down and I'll kill both you and your entire family, OK? I'll kill the law of you, OK? Well... Horace reluctantly agreed to the beast's slightly unreasonable demand and he went home, sadly breaking the news to his beloved daughter, Beauty. Well, a deal is a deal, said Beauty. I will go to the beast and thank you very much for my lovely rose, father. Well, when Beauty arrived at the palace, she found the door was open. She called out, but nobody replied. But Beauty found the palace charming. The dining table was laden with food. Huge pork pies, chicken thighs, parsnips, peas, cauliflower cheese, truffles, trifles and chocolate eclairs. As Beauty tucked into the fabulous banquet, the beast appeared and he shook her hand. Uh, 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 how do you do? Uh, hello, Beauty. Uh, do, you, do you mind if I join you for dinner? Why, of course, said Beauty. As the two of them ate their food and began to chat, Beauty found the beast most engaging. And over the next few weeks, Beauty grew rather fond of the beast and began to think perhaps he was misunderstood. But Beauty's feelings of contentment were disturbed when she gazed into a magic mirror that the beast had given her as a present. Within the mirror, she saw an image of her dear father looking very sickly indeed and beckoning for her presence. She was so sad to see her sisters completely ignoring her dear father's needs as they preened around the house in the finery he had bought them. Oh, I am great! I am great! Look at my dress! My dress is great! Ah, oh, yes, so lovely, I'm gonna have another beer. 
So she went to the beast and explained that she was most concerned about her father's well-being. Uh, well, okay, you, you, you may go and visit your sick father, said the beast, as long as you promise to return after three nights, okay? Beauty quickly returned to her father's house, where she nursed him back to good health. But unfortunately, the days passed so quickly that she forgot her promise to return to the beast after three nights away. It was only when she stumbled upon the magic mirror that she remembered her pledge. And whilst gazing into the mirror, she saw a harrowing image of the beast. He was very, very ill. <gasps> I forgot to return to the beast, she cried. I must go to him. As Beauty approached the palace, she found the beast lying next to the rose bush. He was crying out in great pain. Oh no, said Beauty. I beg of you, beast. Please, don't die. Oh, alas, said the sickly beast. I, I feel I have nothing to live for. Nothing whatsoever. Yes, you have, said Beauty. I love you. I love you very much indeed. Suddenly, a mysterious mist appeared and engulfed the beast for several minutes. And then, as the mist floated away on the breeze, Beauty saw that the beast had transformed into a charming, handsome prince. Your kind words have broken the spell, explained the prince, whose name was Prince Charlie. It transpired that a wicked witch called Michaela had put a spell on the prince when he had refused to hand over his chest of priceless treasure that Prince Charlie's late mother had handed down to him. That very day, Prince Charlie went to Horace and asked for Beauty's hand in marriage. Well, 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 well uh, of course you can marry Beauty, said a thrilled Horace, as long as you promise not to be beastly any more. Yes, of course. I'm sorry I was beastly to you whilst I was a beast. It will not happen again. Apology accepted. Let the celebrations begin, exclaimed Horace. Prince Charlie married Beauty, and her father Horace was best man, with her sisters Mo and Flo as the rather reluctant bridesmaids. Oh, 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 oh! I don't see why she's fit to marry a prince. I am far more suitable, said Flo. Me too. I have far more regal qualities than her, <coughs> said Mo. Oh, don't be so jealous, said Horace. You should be pleased that your sister has married such a marvellous man. I have had such a wonderful day, said Princess Beauty to her prince. And as they rode off on their honeymoon in a horse-drawn carriage, the crowd whooped and cheered with delight. Even Mo and Flo began to see the benefits of their sister marrying a royal prince as a pair of handsome courtiers joined them. Oh, 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 oh. Now we are related to royalty, the sky is the limit! Hello, magazine beckons, said Flo. Yeah! <laughs> Oh, I couldn't agree more, said Mo, and they join in with the cheering throng. Find out more when you hear the story of Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. There was a little girl whose head was in a whirl. She went walking with her worries or cares. This is the story that will tell you the tale of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Once upon a time, in a forest called Nibbly Knoll, there lived a beautiful young girl with long, blonde, curly hair that beamed by the light of the sun. Her name was Goldilocks, and although she was very pretty and very popular amongst the people of the forest, she could at times be a very naughty little girl. She often came home late for tea, 
Anne was climbing trees so high it would cause great concern for her mother and father, who were constantly in fear for their beloved daughter's safety. "'By all means, play in the fields and the meadows, my dear,' said Goldilocks' mother one morning. "'But your father and I forbid you from going into the forest.' "'But I love the forest so much,' said Goldilocks. "'I love to climb the trees and look at the wonderful woodland creatures.' "'You are not to venture into the forest, and that is final,' said Goldilocks' father. "'I do not like you climbing the trees, and we are very concerned that you may get lost.' "'Oh, all right,' said Goldilocks with a sigh. "'I promise I will never venture into the forest again.' "'For the next few days, Goldilocks kept her promise.' But she soon became bored with playing on her swing in the meadow and picking apples from the trees in the orchard. It's no good. I can't resist it, she thought. I am going into the forest to have an adventure. I know I promised my parents not to venture into the woods, but what they won't know surely won't harm them. Making sure her parents couldn't see what she was up to, she tiptoed across the fields till she came to the great forest that she'd grown to love so much. Unfortunately for Goldilocks, she began to wander down a winding path that she was unfamiliar with, causing her both to be lost and confused. Oh no, I think I'm lost, she cried. And as she did, it started to rain, heavily, and in no time at all, Goldilocks found herself in the middle of a huge storm, with howling winds, with thunder, and huge bolts of lightning creating a menacing atmosphere. The sight and sound of woodland creatures' response to the dreadful storm caused Goldilocks so much concern she tried to run home as fast as humanly possible. But Goldilocks was running in absolutely the wrong direction and ended up by a huge lake she had never seen before. Oh dear, what am I to do? she cried. I should have taken my parents' advice and never ventured into the forest. However, slowly but surely, the storm began to cease, and although there was a slight mist across the surface of the lake, Goldilocks spotted a bridge that crossed over to a path, leading to a rather inviting thatched cottage, which was painted in her favourite colours, pink, yellow and blue. What a lovely looking cottage, she said. I will cross that bridge, knock on the door of that cottage, and I will ask the people who live there to help me to find my way home. Yes! Hooray! Clever idea, Goldilocks. <laughs> she approached the door of the cottage and she knocked on the door three times. Unfortunately for Goldilocks, there was no one at home at all. But then she noticed that a window next to the door was slightly ajar. Being the mischievous young girl she was, Goldilocks crept through the window and began to look around the cottage. The first thing she spotted was a rather large table, and around the table were three chairs. On the table itself sat three bowls of steaming porridge. Oh, it looked and smelt so delicious, she grabbed a spoon and started to help herself to the porridge in the largest bowl on the table. But she was disappointed with both the taste and the texture. Oh! It's not as tasty as it smells, and it's far too salty for my liking. Also, it's so hard, it's more like a glorified flapjack, if you ask me. Then, with spoon in hand, she started to eat the porridge from the medium-sized bowl at the other end of the table. No, I don't like that either, she exclaimed. This time I'm finding the porridge too sweet for my liking. This dollop of strawberry jam in the middle is completely overpowering. Then, she began devouring the porridge in the third bowl which, although it contained a much smaller portion, was far more pleasing for Goldilocks' finely tuned taste buds. Oh, yummy! This porridge is not too sweet and not too sour, she said. And within less than a minute, Goldilocks had eaten it all up. So now, feeling very contented but a bit tired, Goldilocks decided to sit down on one of the three chairs that were placed in front of the roaring log fire. Unfortunately, the little chair was far too small and it broke into tiny pieces the moment Goldilocks sat on it. Ouch! she cried. That really hurt. Never mind, I'll try this second chair. It looks slightly more comfortable anyway. But when she sat down on the second chair, which was of a medium size, she found the cushions too squidgy 
Oh, I can't settle on this chair. I hate squidgy cushions, said Goldilocks, and started jumping off the chair. And she hurled the cushions across the room, causing them to smash a beautiful vase on the nearby mantelpiece. Goldilocks decided to try the third chair, which was much bigger. But this time, she found the cushion on the chair too hard. Oh no, she said. I loathe hard cushions. I find them unbearable. In haste, she leapt off the chair, causing it to crash to the floor. Unfortunately, like the little chair, it ended up broken beyond repair. This bad luck I have had with the chairs has left me totally exhausted, said Goldilocks. I think I am going to go upstairs and help myself to a bed and have a nice sleep. On entering the bedroom, she saw three beds. One was small, one medium-sized and one very large. She tried the small one but found the blanket a little itchy. I don't like itchy blankets. I come out in a rash, she said. She then tried the medium-sized bed, but did not like the fact that it had a feather pillow. Oh, no! A feather pillow! I have never liked them at all. They make me sneeze. <coughs> and when she tried out the large bed, it was perfect. Oh, oh, this is wonderful. No itchy blankets, no feather pillows, and the mattress is neither too hard nor too soft. Just perfect for a nice girl like Goldilocks. Goldilocks then fell into a deep, deep sleep. And as she slept, the owners of the cottage crossed the bridge, having been on a strawberry picking expedition. They were a family of three bears. Father Bear, Mother Bear and Baby Bear. I can't wait to eat my porridge, said Baby Bear. Nor can I, said Mother Bear. After our porridge, we can have a feast of strawberries and cream, said Father Bear, as he opened the door of the cottage. As they entered the cottage, Father Bear looked at the table and said, Who's been eating my porridge? And Mother Bear said, Someone's been eating my porridge too. Then Baby Bear cried, Someone's eaten all of my porridge. I am really upset. I was looking forward to it so much. And then Father Bear noticed the damaged chair. Someone has been sitting in my chair and now it's broken, he growled. Someone has been on my chair, said Mother Bear, and the cushion is on the floor next to my favourite vase, which is all smashed into tiny pieces. Someone has been on my chair and it's broken into pieces. Pieces too, said Baby Bear, who began to cry in his mother's arms. Then, following the muddy footprints Goldilocks had left as she had walked up the stairs, the three bears entered the bedroom. Someone's been in my bed. The blankets are ruffled, said Baby Bear. Someone's been in my bed too, said Mother Bear. The pillow was in a different position. Someone is sleeping in my bed, said Father Bear rather significantly. And he let out an enormous growl. <laughs> which woke up Goldilocks immediately. And she couldn't believe her eyes when she saw three bears glaring down at her. At first she thought it was part of a bad dream. And all the three bears began to roar louder and louder. And Goldilocks got up, ran down the stairs and left the cottage immediately, slamming the door behind her. Then she got to the other side of the bridge and she met a huntsman who was an old friend of her father. She told him what had happened and after giving Goldilocks some stern words about venturing into the forest alone, he took her home safely to her parents' house. And there, Goldilocks apologised profusely to her mother and father. I have been very naughty, she said. Not only have I put myself in danger by entering into the forest alone, but I have trespassed into someone else's home. Never mind, you have learned your lesson, said her father. 
before giving her a huge loving hug. Meanwhile, back at the bear's cottage, Mother Bear was serving up strawberries and cream. I think it was very good that our growling scared that little girl, said Father Bear. It'll teach her a lesson she will never forget. Then he looked into the eyes of Baby Bear and said, I hope you learn from this too, Baby Bear. Never go out into the forest alone or trespass into strangers' homes. Your father is right, said Mother Bear. You never know what's lurking out there in the wild forest. And on that note, the three bears sat at the family table and enjoyed their feast of strawberries and cream. He put him in with a glove and he escaped from the oven singing Run, run as fast as you can This is a story that will tell you the tale of a cheeky little gingerbread man A cheeky little gingerbread man A long time ago there was an old man called Sedgwick Goodfellow who lived with his wife Vera and on the weekends their beloved grandson Jasper would come to stay with them in their tumble-down cottage in the heart of the English countryside. One Sunday afternoon, Vera decided to create a funny-looking little man made from gingerbread. And using bright blue icing, she added eyes. Then, with red icing, a little nose and a mouth. And she placed him on a baking tray and she said to her grandson, Jasper, while your grandfather and I pop into the woods to uh, have a romantic stroll, I'd like you to keep your eye on the gingerbread man. We don't want him to burn. Quite right, said Sedgwick. After all, he won't taste very nice if he's reduced to cinders. And as the old couple strolled around the woods, hand in hand, talking of times gone by, Jasper began to play with his toys completely forgetting about his grandparents' instructions. And suddenly, from the kitchen, he heard a clanking sound. Oh, said Jasper. What on earth is that clanking sound coming from the kitchen? He rushed into the kitchen and he saw the gingerbread man climbing out of the oven and running out of the door. Crumbs, exclaimed Jasper. As the gingerbread man bolted through the woods at great speed and Jasper followed him as fast as he could, he managed to attract the attention of his grandparents, who also began to give chase. But the gingerbread man was much faster than Jasper and his grandparents, and just before he disappeared from view, he uttered the taunting words, Run, run, as fast as you can! You can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread man! Oh, I'm very tired. Oh, we must sit down and, and take a breather, said Sedgwick. I couldn't agree more, <sighs> gasped Vera, and all three of them sat down on a grass verge to regain their strength. What a strange occurrence, pondered Jasper. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Nor have I, agreed Sedgwick. Fancy a gingerbread man coming to life. But you were warned to keep an eye on him. You must learn to concentrate more in the future. I know, I know, replied Jasper. I I'm, I'm very sorry. It won't happen again. But meanwhile, the gingerbread man was running down a path next to a babbling brook. And by the babbling brook were two fishermen. Hey, hey, where are you going, gingerbread man? inquired one of the fishermen. You can't catch me, cried the gingerbread man. I've already outrun a young boy and his grandparents, and I can outrun you too. Run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread man, he yelled teasingly as he ran across a nearby field. And sure enough, as fast as the fishermen chased him, they simply could not catch up with the gingerbread man. Oh, hey, ah, uh, hey, that's it. Hey, I'm so tired, I must take a little rest now, said one of the fishermen. I, I, I agree, said the other, and the pair of them sat down defeated at the foot of a crooked stile. As the gingerbread man continued to run across the field, he passed a young man and woman who were playing croquet. Where do you think you're going, gingerbread man? asked the lady. Yes, yes, I was going to ask the same question, said the young man. I have never seen a gingerbread man running before. Most peculiar. Put it this way, 
said the gingerbread man. I have outrun an old lady, an old man, a young boy and two fishermen. And now I'm going to outrun you. Well, I always rise to a challenge, said the young man. So do I, said the young lady. Let's get him. Run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. The young man and the young lady ran as fast as possible, but they had to admit defeat halfway up a steep hill. Oh, 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 I, oh, 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 I give up, said the young man. So do I, for now, said the young lady, and they stopped in their tracks to rest and to eat cucumber sandwiches. But the gingerbread man continued to run at great speed. As he pelted through the woods, he passed a rather vicious-looking wild boar. And, uh, where are you running, gingerbread man? inquired the wild boar. Look, said the gingerbread man impatiently. I have outrun an old lady, an old man, a young boy, two fishermen, a young man and a young woman who were playing croquet. Snotty-nosed toffs. In fact, I only have one thing to say to you. Run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. As the gingerbread man raced through the woods, the wild boar pursued him, snarling, When I catch up with you, I am going to gobble you up, you horrible gingerbreaded little creep. But lo and behold, in no time at all, the gingerbread man had outrun the boar, who was so tired he went for a nap in a nearby cave. The gingerbread man continued to run and was now spotted by a fox who was resting in a hollow tree. And, uh... Where do you think you're going, gingerbread man? Oozed the fox with a relaxed tone in his voice. Oh, ho, 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 ho. here we go again, said the gingerbread man. Look, I have outrun an old lady, an old man, a young boy, two fishermen, a young man and a young woman who are playing croquet, a wild boar, and believe me, he was both wild and boring, and you're being wildly boring right now, asking me the same old question. So get this into your thick skull, Foxy boy, you'll never be able to catch me. So listen and listen well. As I said to the others, run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Um, uh, I beg your pardon, yawns the fox. You'll have to excuse me. I'm slightly hard of hearing. Just come a little closer and I'll be able to hear your valuable words. The gingerbread man impatiently stopped in his tracks and moved closer towards the fox. OK, slow coach, I will spell it out to you. Run, run, as fast as you can, OK? You can't catch me because I am the gingerbread man! Got that, Foxy? Oh, I'm terribly sorry, said the fox. Due to the uh, whistling of the wind, I'm still finding it dreadfully hard to hear you. Do come a little closer, please, gingerbread man. OK, foxy boy, for the very last time, here we go. The gingerbread man stepped closer to the fox and bellowed sarcastically into the fox's ear. Run, run, as fast as you can. You cannot catch me, right? Because I am the gingerbread man. OK? And at this point, the fox snapped out of his relaxed position, pounced on the gingerbread man, and with his white, sharp teeth, gobbled him up in a matter of seconds. Gobbled him up! The entire gingerbread man! And who can blame the fox? Vera's recipe was so very tasty. And after all, gingerbread men are made to be devoured. And meanwhile, back at Tumbledown Cottage, Vera spoke to Jasper as she placed a rather large gooseberry crumble in the oven. Your grandfather and I are, are just popping out to do some gardening. Yes, keep an eye on the oven this time, said Sedgwick. We don't want any more catastrophes. Oh, I'll be much more careful now. I'll be sure to be checking it every five minutes, said Jasper. And luckily, gooseberry crumbles don't have legs. <laughs> That's a good point, said Sedgwick, and the three of them laughed with all their might. <laughs> Boy who was filled with joy when he met a wicked man in Peking. Within the magic lamp, he 
he found And really turned his life around Through its genie he could wish for anything Then he met the genie of the ring Once upon a time, in the city of Peking, there was a young boy by the name of Aladdin whose poor mother, Widow Twanky, owned a small laundry on the outskirts of the city. One day, when Aladdin was helping his mother in the laundry, a strange-looking man with a long pointed beard and flowing gown walked in and exclaimed, Hey, hey, Aladdin! Yeah! I am your long-lost great-uncle Ebenezer! Yeah, I am from a far-flung eastern land, and I'm here to make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. Wow, said Aladdin. If I become rich, I could help my poor mother lead a more comfortable life. Anyway, Abanaza took Aladdin down a winding path that led to a huge cave. Okay, Aladdin, listen. Inside that cave, there is a magic lamp. Yeah, magic lamp, and it's encrusted with diamonds and pearls. I mean, I would go and fetch it myself, but uh, uh, the, 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 the entrance is too small. You, however, Aladdin, my baby, you are the perfect size. All you gotta do is to fetch me that lamp, and I will ensure that you and your poor widowed mother will be so rich that neither of you will ever have to work again. How about that? Well, that, that sounds great, said Aladdin, but the entrance is blocked off by a rock. How do I enter the cave, Uncle Abanaza? Leave that to me, replied Abanaza. And he produced a large wand and exclaimed in a booming voice, Open Sesame! And suddenly, the rock rolled slightly to the right making just enough room for Aladdin to squeeze into the cave. In you go, dear boy, and don't come back without that lamp, okay? As Aladdin entered the cave, he saw really creepy things, like skeletons, giant spiders, and huge bats with large white fangs. Hurry it up, yelled Abanazar. Find the lamp and bring it to me at once! All right, replied Aladdin. Keep your hair on. It's dark and spooky in here. Then suddenly, Aladdin noticed a tunnel to the side of the cave. At the end of the tunnel, he found the lamp. Although indeed it did have a few coloured stones embedded in the copper from which it was made, it was obvious to Aladdin that they were fake. As for the lamp itself, it was old and battered. Blimey. I was expecting more than this, said Aladdin to himself, as he walked towards the entrance of the cave, with lamp in hand. Aha! Ha! Ha! I see you have the lamp! Now! Now! Pass the lamp to me! Immediately! Said Abanaza, in a voice that made Aladdin feel slightly alarmed. Your voice has changed, said Aladdin. And why are you so eager to get your hands on this battered old lamp? Can't you wait for me to climb out? How dare you be so insolent! shouted Abanaza. And to teach Aladdin a lesson, he angrily waved his magic wand in the air, shouting the words, Close! Sashumi! The rock that allowed Aladdin to enter closed, trapping him in the dark and spooky cave. Poor Aladdin. He sat on a stone and he cried for hours while staring at this battered old lamp. This lamp is filthy, he said, and to keep himself busy, he started to rub the lamp with his sleeve. Then suddenly, something magic happened. A silver mist started to seep from the spout of the lamp. And in no time at all, it had morphed into a strange-looking creature with huge eyes, golden earrings, and a large hooked nose. Uh, well, thanks a bunch, Aladdin, said the creature. You've woken me from a deep, deep sleep. Who are you? asked Aladdin. Who do you think I am? said the creature. I'm the genie of the lamp, aren't I? And unfortunately, your wish is my command. What do you mean? 
I just told you, your wish is my command. Right, every time you rub the lamp, I pop out and I grant you a wish, don't I? I just hope you don't take advantage of me good nature. Wow, said Aladdin. Can I have any wish at all? Yes, sighed the genie. Oh, Brillo. Well then, um, uh, I wish to be back at the laundry with my mother. Your wish is my command. And in no time, Aladdin found himself back at the laundry with his mother, the lamp still held firmly in his hands. Aladdin explained to his mother what had happened. She was shocked to hear how the wicked Abanaza had left him to perish. Then Aladdin rubbed the lamp, causing the genie to appear once more. Hello, Aladdin. What do you want now? Oh, well, sorry to trouble you, said Aladdin, but I wanted to introduce you to my mother, Widow Twanky, and to thank you for getting me out of that dark and dingy cave. Hey, no trouble, said the genie. Then he handed Aladdin a beautiful gold ring. Now listen, wear this ring at all times, said the genie. If anyone attempts to steal the lamp, you just rub the ring three times and help will be at hand, all right? Now, as much as it has been nice meeting your mother, I would now like to get back to my kip. Oh no, one more thing before you go, said Aladdin. Uh, I've got another wish. I wish you could transform my mother's small laundry into a huge mansion and grant us enough wealth to make us comfortable for the rest of our lives. The usual then, said the genie. Very well, your wish is, inevitably, my command. And he flicked his fingers, causing the laundry to transform into a huge stylish mansion. And there, on the floor, were several enormous bags of gold coins. Anyway, over the next year, Aladdin and Widow Twanky started mixing with people of great influence. Oh, this is the life! said Widow Twanky, while throwing a lavish dinner party for none other than the ruler of China, Emperor Hee Haw. The Emperor's daughter, Princess Kyoko, was very beautiful indeed. Over the ensuing months, she and Aladdin fell in love and were married at the royal palace. Oh, I'm related to royalty now! said Widow Twanky, as she danced with Emperor Hee Haw, who, like her, had been widowed many years ago. While the celebrations continued at the palace, the wicked Abanaza broke into Aladdin's mansion and stole the magic lamp. <laughs> the lamp is now mine! And Abanaza rubbed the lamp, thus summoning up the genie. Abanaza wickedly asked the genie to turn the mansion back into the old laundry. And then he ordered the genie to bring Aladdin and Widow Twanky to him. <laughs> the lamp is now mine. The genie is under my command. And incidentally, Aladdin, you are rich no more. <laughs> However, a quick thinking Aladdin rubbed his golden ring three times and something magical happened. A beautiful genie appeared. She looked at Aladdin and said, I am the genie of the ring. Master, your wish is my command. Ooh, fab! In that case, I wish that Abanaza turns to stone. Well, that's a, a little harsh, said the genie of the ring. But uh, you are the boss, so here goes. And she took a deep breath, and she blew a gust of air towards Abanaza. No! Who immediately turned to stone. Hey. Hey, it's so nice to see you again, my lovely little sugar plum, said the genie of the lamp. You too, darling boy, 
replied the genie of the ring. Do, 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 do you two know each other? asked Aladdin. Well, of course we do. She's my wife, said the genie of the lamp. And before Aladdin and Widow Twanky could thank the genies, they had both disappeared into the lamp in a flash of green smoke. Taking the ring and the lamp with them, Aladdin and his mum returned to the wedding reception, which continued into the early hours. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad I met you, Kyoko. You are the girl of my dreams, cooed Aladdin to his princess bride. I feel the same, said Kyoko, and I can't wait for our honeymoon in Timbuktu. And it was during the celebrations that Emperor Hee-Haw plucked up the courage to propose to his new love, Widow Twanky. <gasps> oh, Empress Hee-Haw! Oh, it's got a nice twang to it, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay, I accept, Mr. Emperor. Oh, thank you, thank you, said the Emperor. You give both me and the story a very happy Ending. <laughs> Aladdin was a boy who was filled with joy when he met a wicked man in Peking. Within the magic lamp he found, it really turned his life around. Through its genie, he could wish for anything. Then he met the genie of the ring. Simba the sailor Billy. When he spent all the wealth his father made But when he sailed the seven seas He made the money back with ease Selling silver a very high grade On his travels so much courage he displayed Once upon a time in Baghdad There was a very wealthy young man called Sinbad Sinbad had inherited a fortune when his rich merchant father had died. Sinbad was very generous with his wealth, always buying fine clothes for himself and his ever-growing circle of friends. Oh, I'm, I'm so rich and I have so many friends around me. I feel as though I've been blessed by the gods, he said to one of his many cronies. But one day Sinbad received a rather nasty shock when he discovered he had spent his entire fortune. Oh no! This is terrible news, he cried. What's more, all the friends who had been sucking up to him for years had mysteriously disappeared into thin air. Huh. Well, so much for that shallow bunch, he sighed. But never mind, I must find a way of earning a living. So Sinbad sold his huge house, and with the money he made from that, he purchased some very expensive silk. I must follow in my father's footsteps and become a merchant, he said, as he walked to the nearby harbour. When he got to the harbour, he approached some merchants who were loading cargo onto a huge galleon. And after some negotiations, the merchants agreed that Sinbad could join them on their travels. And together with all their merchandise to sell in foreign lands, they set off to journey far across the seven seas. All was going very well until one night, far out to sea, beneath a dark, foreboding sky, they were all awakened by a terrifying screeching sound. They all looked up in horror to see a huge, prehistoric, one-eyed bird swooping down on the ship. This was a Cyclops, and its evil intention was to seize the galleon and use it as a nest in which she could lay her eggs. And with her massive claws, she tipped the ship upside down, causing all the merchants to drown in the sea, apart from one of them. Sinbad the Sailor. As the triumphant Cyclops flew away with its magnificent prize, Sinbad managed to cling onto a piece of passing driftwood, and with the tide in his favour, he began to float safely towards a distant shore. When he washed up on the beach, Sinbad was greeted by a wise old man called Charubu, who took pity on Sinbad's plight. He took him to see the island's ruler, who was called King Alkuza. When Sinbad explained to the king how he had arrived on the island, 
Alcuza offered him a job helping out with the cargo ships down at the island's port. Now, one day, while Sinbad was on duty, working at the port, Charubu approached Sinbad with a huge, rusty old trunk. Hey, I recognise that trunk, exclaimed Sinbad. And so you should, said Charubu. It has your name clearly embossed on the lid. Charubu prized open the trunk to reveal the silk Sinbad had brought with him on his maiden voyage. It washed up on the shore very early this morning, explained Charubu as he handed over the trunk to a very delighted Sinbad. Sinbad sold the wonderful exotic silk to King Alcuza at an excellent price. Oh, oh, thank you, Sinbad. This happens to be my favorite kind of silk, said the king. I shall commission a thousand suits to be made for me by one of my millions of royal tailors. How lovely for me. Sinbad thanked the king and Chirubu for their kind hospitality before making his way safely back home to Baghdad. However, back in Baghdad, Sinbad soon became quite restless for another adventure. Taking with him another cargo of silk, Sinbad took to the high seas with merchants from the local harbour. But, unfortunately for Sinbad and his friends, before they reached their destination, a pirate ship attacked and threw them all overboard into the shark-infested waters. Well, they all swam for their lives, and Sinbad and the merchants were washed up on a rocky island. Now, in the middle of the island was an enormous castle that was owned by an evil giant troll called Fadi. And Fadi, the repulsive creature, opened his door and quickly threw a net over Sinbad and the merchants. Ha <laughs> ha! laughed Fadi. Your punishment for trespassing on my land is to be eaten up by me. Yes! <laughs> Fadi placed his hand under the net and started to gobble up the merchants one by one. But when he got to Sinbad and two of his colleagues, luckily the troll grew tired. I am now going to have a little kip, I think, and uh, then I will eat you later, said Fadi, as he lay down at the foot of a rock and fell into a deep, deep sleep. Well, as the evil troll snored, Sinbad managed to free himself and his two companions by cutting the net with his trusty sword. But, before they tiptoed off, Sinbad approached Fadi, who was belching disgusting fumes and snoring ferociously. The fast-thinking sailor lit a match and threw it towards the beast. Due to the various gases, the parping Fadi was set on fire immediately. And roaring in pain, a giant troll exploded! Yes, exploded! and Fadi was eventually reduced to a pile of smelly ashes. Right, let's get out of here, whispered Sinbad, and they all ran towards the sea in the hope that a passing ship would stop and take them home. But their hopes were dashed when suddenly, emerging from the sand dunes, a nasty-looking slimy creature appeared. She had a long, wart-ridden nose, a pointy hat, and six spindly arms, which on closer inspection were venomous snakes. I am Shayla, the Sand Witch, and I know that you are all here to steal my treasure. The Sand Witch's angry head span around at great speed, and her snake arms grabbed Sinbad's two friends and strangled them. Sinbad was bitten on the arm by one of the snakes, but luckily he survived. So he drew out his trusty sword and skillfully chopped off the head of each snake. You are gonna pay for this, screamed Sheila. The sandwich jumped up high onto a rock to make her seem taller and more powerful. But Sinbad noticed that the rock was unsteady and he pushed it with all his might, sending the sandwich careering down into an abyss. Yes, 
Selena the Nasty Sandwich was never to be seen again. <laughs> and Sinbad could not believe his luck when he looked in the hole left by the rock and he found an enormous pile of shimmering gold and precious stones that would make a man rich beyond his wildest dreams. Still fearing for his life, Sinbad filled up his pockets and made his way to the coast, where he managed to flag down a ship. And as luck would have it, the captain of the ship was his old friend Charubu. And for the price of two diamonds and a dazzling white pearl, Charubu agreed to have his galleon turned around and deliver Sinbad safely back to Baghdad. At the end of the journey, Cherubu stayed for a whole two days just to hear about Sinbad the Sailor's fascinating expeditions. And then Cherubu came to England, he told me all about it, and now I'm telling you. How about that?